pretty um, confronting reading, wasn't it? We just had from Matthew's Gospel. So uh, to take our minds off it for just a moment, I'm going to tell you a story about a time, one of the many times when I've been a bad parent. Um, it was a few years ago, uh, my family and I, we were living in Sydney, uh, and the house we were living in, uh, we didn't have a garage, we had to park our car on the side of the road. I remember one evening we'd been out, my wife Kath and our four children, and we arrived home, it was fairly late, and uh, little kids, that most of them were asleep, if I remember rightly, in the car. So we did that thing that parents do, we unstrapped them, we carried them inside one by one, uh, we brushed their teeth, we got them in their pyjamas, we got them ready for bed, and then... As we started getting ready for bed ourselves, um, Kath said to me, did you do Maggie? <laughs> Thought you did Maggie. So we quickly ran outside to the car in the dark and we saw through the glass a very distressed little uh, two, three-year-old. Um, you know there are different stages of grief and um, with infants, most of the stages all look the same, just howling. Uh, but she was in the stage of grief that looks like this. You know, after the crying is over, the, the shuddering breath um, as she tries to recover and recuperate her, her composure. But for, I don't know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, she'd been in the dark, in a confined space, utterly terrified and feeling completely abandoned. So, yeah, bad parenting moment, but it doesn't quite end there because just a couple of weeks ago, I was here early for Arvo Church and I was just in the office doing some photocopying when Libby Horton came in, who'd also arrived, and she said, Dave, um... I think you've locked your girls in the car. They're signalling to me from inside your car. <laughs> My girls by this point, of course, are 13 and 14. Uh, but yeah, sure enough, somehow they managed to be locked in the car. Um, so it, it seems that some things you never learn. But I want to take us back to Maggie's feelings at um, age two or three, um, being in a car in the dark, a confined space, alone, and feeling utterly abandoned. Because if we can capture that emotion, I think what we're doing is, is coming to terms with a feeling that a lot of people have in relation to God. Uh, we feel abandoned. We feel alone. We feel like we're in a, a, a confined and limited and fixed amount of space. And if there's more out there, it's not much good to us in here. And we tell ourselves stories to try to make sense of it. Well, God made the world maybe once, but he doesn't seem to be involved in it now. Well, God didn't make the world. It just sort of got here. Or we can't know who made the world, but either way, it can't really relate to my life here and now. Or maybe, um, more tragically for some people, I believe God made the world. I believe God is involved in the world. I just think he's abandoned me. All of those stories land us in the same place, ultimately. It's a place where we are trapped in a limited, confined space, we are alone and we are forced to come to grips with the fact that that seems to be our entire reality. And what we find in Jesus as we uh, reflect on him today, uh, we find someone who really effectively comes to the car and breaks the glass. He, he invades the space that we thought was our only space. He shines a light in so that we can see more. That light shows us the stuff inside the confined space is real enough, but now we're able to see it more fully, more richly, uh, with more depth. In fact, Jesus does even more than that because, as you may know, he claims to be the light. He says that he is the light. He is here with you in this space. He always has been. He has always been the reason you can see anything. And so baptism marks really the start of a journey of learning to see the world in accordance with the light of Christ's presence. But it's not very easy. It's not always easy. It can be hard to see the presence of Christ. We can go through our whole lives and it never occurred to us that Christ is here with us, shining light into our darkness. And so what I want to do today is just identify a few of the places where Jesus is, in fact, present and accessible in ways that you might not have noticed. Because although he is present everywhere, what I don't want to say is that there are places where he's present and places where he's not. It's, a, it's, it's the case that Christ is present everywhere, fully present. It's just that his presence is an invisible one, a hidden one. 
He is in all things. God's word, God's voice speaking to us in everything, in creation. In every act of God's communication to us, in every atom, every molecule is held together by the presence of Christ. It's just that it's not always easy for us to identify him in all of those places. So today, three places, not where Christ is, because he's everywhere, but where he comes to us in a particular way and invites us to notice him and becomes a little more visible. And the first place that we find him is in others. Now this week, um, the wonderful people at AWG Glazing in here in Corwell fixed our glass door, which had had a rock tossed, into it, tossed through it. They fixed it, and then when it came to pay, they said, uh, no, don't charge us, it's a donation. Take it as a donation. Um, really, really wonderful, really heartwarming. Sometimes, of course, we can see Christ's presence to us in these remarkable acts of generosity. But uh, as I think of um, seeing Christ in others, I want to follow the lead that Jesus takes us to in our reading today, which is far more challenging than that. The Gospel reading, as I said before, it's Christ the King Sunday, the last day of the church's year before we start Advent next week. And it points to a final judgment. God's promise of justice will be fulfilled. This judgment will be delivered by one called the King or the Son of Man. And a judgment will be delivered according to how we treat him. Apparently, this king has faced periods of hardship where his power has not been recognised, perhaps a coup, perhaps he's been in exile, he's been in prison, he's been a vagrant, he's been on the run, hungry and thirsty. But finally, he's enthroned again in power and those who treated him with love during his time of exile, they will be invited in and those who did not will be excluded. And do you remember in the readings, both groups say... I'm sorry, we don't remember. We don't ever remember meeting you before. And the king says to them, as you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. So Christ meets us in our neighbour, but in particular he meets us in our needy neighbour. The hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, the one who's in sorrow. And what this means, of course, is that Christ is not far from you at all, but he's as close to you as a person in need is. And that's very close. Kids at school, there will be people who are doing it tough. Uh, they're gossiped about, they're bullied. Uh, friends, in our workplaces, we will encounter people who are doing it tough. They are excluded. They are talked about. Uh, in our families... There are some people going through hard times, some people that we don't naturally relate to as well. On our street, in our retirement village, whatever it is, wherever there is someone in need, Christ is there. The need may be a physical need, hunger, thirst. It may be a social need. They're excluded. They're isolated. It might be both. Disabled people, for instance, have to endure both physical and social exclusion. Jesus comes near to us in these environments and he comes near to us in disguise. Of course we don't recognise those moments as encounters with the king who will judge us. And in fact it's very convenient for us to ignore that fact because it actually demands something of us. Although Jesus' words remind us that to ignore him in those interactions is a costly decision. There's a second place that Christ is present and we can encounter him. And that is in the church. And there's a hint of that in the words of Jesus when he says, what you did for the least of these members of my family, in verse 40. There's a sense that the community that he's got particular um, focus on here are members of his family, his disciples. Christ is present in all people. But his presence is visible in a different way in the community of those people who come together and worship him in community. You can also see this in our New Testament reading, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23, which describes the church as his body. What is the body? The body is the part of the person that can be seen. You know, you are more than a body, but the, your body is how you act in the world. It's how people see you and interact with you. Of course, it sounds very arrogant when Christians say that Christ is here in a particular way, um, and it sounds like we're saying we're better than other people, which is precisely not what we are saying. 
Um, you will not come to church and find perfect people. You will come to church and find broken people. But what we believe is that out of the pieces of our brokenness, God is building something through our worship, through word and sacrament, through service. Christ is being made known here and encountered here in a way that is unique and special. He's making himself known to us. Through us, he's making himself known to others. He changed lives in love between people who actually wouldn't naturally get on with each other. And in sacraments like baptism or like the bread and the wine. There's a third place that uh, Christ is made particularly present and visible to the world, and that is in history. The words of Jesus that we've read today, they are, of course, the words of a real man who really did live and walk 2,000 years ago. He grew up in a real time in history, a real place, lived in, a, in an area called Galilee, and despite never writing a book or leading an army or uh, ruling a nation, he is by far the most influential person on all of human history. And as we come close to Christmas, this is a thing we're going to give special attention to, that God's voice which echoes through all of creation, it's present in all of reality, has actually become visible in a stunning and unmissable way. His word to us would do more than just speak to us in creation and in the church and in our neighbours. It would take on our very flesh, our human nature. God's word to us would emerge in visible form in a mysterious and miraculous way as an embryo, embryo inside a, a faith-filled woman named Mary. He would be born into extremely humble circumstances. He would learn a trade. He would grow up and become a, a young man in Galilee. He would start to teach others and act as God's agent in the world. He would become known as a teacher and a healer, and he would face a final great confrontation with the leaders of his nation in Jerusalem. Now, at each stage, what we see in this journey is we see greater precision, greater focus. There is a general truth that's everywhere that God's word Christ is everywhere and in all things, but this general truth begins to coalesce and condense and begins to take a visible shape and form. Christ, God's word, always and everywhere present, has now come into the world in the form of a particular human being, seen by others, heard by them, touched by them. He exists under the gaze of history, we can still read the sources that describe this remarkable human life. And now we come to a world that believes it's, it's effectively isolated and trapped, like it's in a locked car, abandoned by God. And what we're told is, look here, this is God, this man, this is God. God is not the absent parent who locks their child in the car and gets distracted with other things. God is not a creator who kicks things off and then lets the world just run its course without him being involved. If you want to know what God is like, you look here at this human being, this man who loves the sinner and the outcast and the broken, who ministers to the sick, who challenges the self-righteous, who raises the dead. He's unmissable in human form to, to break through all of our misconceptions. Of course, the great tragedy is he's unmissable, but of course he's missable. We miss him. We don't recognise him. And in those words of the Gospel reading today, we, we, these were fulfilled very, very directly. For the king was unrecognised by most. They saw that he was a person, but they didn't recognise his full identity. They thought they were eliminating a troublemaker, an insignificant troublemaker from Galilee. It never occurred to them that what they were doing, they were doing to the King, to the Son of Man, the Son of God. They never, they never stop to consider that they might be doing this to the one who holds together all creation, who is present in all parts of the created world. It never occurred to them that they were doing this to God. See, just as God has shown his true feelings for us by lovingly, lovingly entering into our world as a, as a human, we took that opportunity to show our true feelings to him by crucifying him. 
And so he was excluded, betrayed, imprisoned, nailed to a cross where he suffered hunger and thirst. We may feel abandoned by God. Well, God's word has entered even into that feeling of abandonment. On his way to the cross, every human help abandoned him. And so he even believes does his father in heaven until finally he dies on a cross, utterly alone. The great irony, the great paradox of that moment is at the very moment that we most misread the situation, when we missed the, the presence of the visible word of God, in that moment of abandonment, that is the moment where God spoke most clearly and most loudly about who he is and what he's done for us. To declare that all of the lonely and isolated and abandoned and thirsty and hungry and imprisoned and excluded, all are now invited to come to God. And his arms that are outstretched on the cross extend forgiveness to all people and declare that new life is on offer. So today uh, we all have a choice. Christ is here. He is calling us. Our choice is what will we notice? What will we see? This week in our work, in our schools, in our homes, will we notice the presence of Jesus? Will we notice how our treatment of others reveals an attitude that we have to him? Or will we continue to block out the idea that Jesus is present in our work, in our school, in our neighbourhood, in every part of our life? What about the community of his church? Will we recognise his presence here, revealed in a particular way amongst his disciples? And what will we do with this man, Jesus? The man in history who was crucified for us to show us God's love. Will we recognise who that really was? Or will we stay locked in the car by ourselves? In a moment we're going to have the baptism of Blaise. What will we see in that moment? Will we see a water ceremony, a, a new life being celebrated, a, a, a you know, wonderful little kid that we can, we can um, celebrate together? I hope we'll see that. But will we see any more than that? Or will that be the extent of what we see? Will we see Christ himself here? In his church, among his people, in the water, holding blaze, welcoming him, present to wash and to clean any who come to him. And challenging us as well. He invites us, but he challenges us to recognise him in the least of these. Including in the community of his disciples, the church. But particularly recognising him in the man who died and rose again for our salvation. The reason the judgement scene in that reading is so frightening is because it assumes we all have responsibility for the decisions that we make. We are responsible for what we choose to see. Whether we see a life in which God is pushed to the edges, conveniently away from every confronting decision, or a world in which God's word is present in every part, speaking to us and calling us and inviting us. The question we all face each moment is how will we respond? to the presence of the King.